Okay. All right. So sorry, this recording is going to start in the middle of this. I will come back and talk about the stuff that we did up above. I just noticed that my record symbol wasn't doing its thing. Okay. Um, so where we're at here is indexing and slicing strings. This will allow us to um, take a string like this, hello, comma, world. If we want to get out individual characters out of that, we just do them as indexes, right? So if we say spam, which is our string variable, and we say zero, we'll get back the H. And four is going to give us back the O, negative one giving us back the exclamation point. So you can do this to get certain pieces of a string out. You can also use it as a slice if we want to get chunks of that string out. So say you always want to grab the first three characters of whatever they type in, or the first five characters of whatever they type in. You could always slice off the first five characters. Or maybe you always want the last five characters or whatever they type. All right. Um, let's see here. You can use the operator of in and not in with strings. So if you want to see if the string hello is inside the string of hello world, you could also go in and check that, true or false. You could use these with if statements, while loops, et cetera, whatever you want to use. Um, if it's false, you could do that. You can also see if there is, in this case, a blank space inside the word spam, and you can see whether or not that's in there as well. That one's a little confusing, right? So that one is basically seeing, is there something in spam? It's a little, little goofier than what you would expect. All right. Notice when you get true and false and or in any strings, they're case sensitive, right? So if I have a capital hello and hello, that's true. But if I do is all caps hello inside hello world, that will come back false. Everything is case sensitive in Python. Um, let's see, if we want to put strings inside other strings, so far we have done string concatenation, right? So if I had this variable of a name and age, and I wanted to put that in a string, I would have to do something like, hello, my name is plus name plus, and then I have the string period, I am, and then we have to convert age over to a string, then we have to tack on the left. It makes this really complicated string, right? Instead of doing this, we can use um, inner string polation. However, we won't use this form, but I'll show it to you here. So inner string polation, what that does is you put a percent %s inside your string. You format it exactly the way you would want it to be printed out. Does everybody see that? So I just say, my name is percent %s, I am percent %s years old. And then at the end of this, you use a percent and then you list the two variables that you want to go in their place. So this first percent S becomes name. The second percent S is age. All right. I would prefer you not use this, but we instead use F strings. Python 3.6 introduced F strings. It's way easier than that. What you do is you put an F at the beginning of the string. You're going to print out your string just like you would want. And in place of this, instead of a percent %s and having to know the order that you put it in, you just flat put the name of the variable in there, all right? So you do the um, braces there, you put the name, it dumps in Al right here. You put this, this will be next year, age plus one. Notice we do not have to convert this over to a string, it does it automatically, all right? So we just say age, we can add one to it and it will automatically get converted to a string to print it out in the right format. So in one of your homework assignments, I will ask you to use F strings in order to do that. This is what I'm talking about, where you just put an F before the string and use these curly braces to dump in the variables. This is a whole lot easier than doing the string concatenation stuff that you guys are used to doing so far. Yeah, or still, you put in front of it, right? still what? You put in front of it. Uh, if you are printing this out, yes. This is just building a string is all this is doing. So if you actually wanted to print something out, um, I don't blanking out today. So if we had these two variables and we had the string that we wanted like this, let's take these out of here. We would say something like print this quote like that. And that will place name inside this particular location. 
and that will place age inside of here. And in this case, we're also adding one at the end of that. Everybody see how that works? So if you have a really long string you're trying to build based off the input from a bunch of different people or from a bunch of different uh, strings that you're saving, this is a whole lot easier to put things together versus one that looks like the string concatenation, which is something like this, right? You would have this plus this plus making sure this gets converted to his age and then adding it all in. This is complicated. This is way easier. All right. F strings. Okay. What else we got here? Um, let's see. Other string methods. So before I go down to string methods, I just want to recap what we missed up here at the top. We talked about string literals. All this is talking about is using double quotes instead of single quotes, right? I introduced this back in week two because it feels like you guys should know this early on, all right? We talked about escape characters. If we want to escape different characters in our string, we also have special ones for escaping a single quote, a double quote, if we want to add a tab or a new line or some extra spacing there, right? The way to get around all of that is just to use an R for a raw string, and this will take whatever goes inside that string and puts it in there. We'll also use our strings when we talk about regular expressions next week, all right? The only other piece that I talked about was single um, or triple single quotes. This is if you want to print it in exactly the format that you paste it in here. And then triple double quotes is if you have a multi-line comment, which is what you guys will use in your midterm exam or uh, midterm projects, not in the exam. Okay, that catches us up there. So string methods. Remember, a method goes off of whatever the string is, right? Functions are something that we call. We pass something into it. A method is something that we do off of a data type, typically. So in this case, strings. So what we can do is, and this is where you guys can finally start cleaning up input from people. So you want to pay attention here because for your midterm, where I say you have to sanitize your data, that means that you have to check to make sure they gave you valid input. And you want to be able to use all these kinds of methods in order to do that check, right? So if we have spam equals hello world, and we want to convert that all to uppercase, we just say spam equals spam.upper. That converts everything that was in here to uppercase, and therefore spam is now all uppercase. If we convert it to dot lower, it converts everything to lowercase. Does everybody know why that would be easier? What would you use upper and lower for? What's that? Kind of a dialogue, but sometimes you have them type in Y or N for yes and no, right? You guys remember our checks? We had to do capital yes, capital N. We had to check for lowercase N. We had to check for uppercase and then some lowercase. If we just use take their answer and convert it to uppercase, then we only have to do one check. Regardless of what they type in, we only have to check for all caps yes. Or if we use dot lower, it only has to check against lowercase lower. It keeps you from having to list out every single possible option. If you convert it, you cut them all in half. So this is a great way for you to check if somebody typed in what you wanted. You could just do a quick check as to whether it's yes or no into a question, something like that. So what am I talking about? Say we had a dialogue that looks something like this. Print, do you want to continue, all right? And then we say choice equals input. And then we can do an if there, right? So if choice equals equals yes, or choice equals equals yes, et cetera. Instead of doing all of that, all we have to do here is go choice dot lower, right? And this doesn't actually change their answer. All we're doing is taking their answer and converting it to lowercase for the purposes of this test. Now, all we have to do is have lowercase yes. We do not have to have other options. The only other option would be or choice dot lower equals equals lowercase y. That will check for both uppercase yes, just a uppercase y. It will check for all of that in just two simple choices. So it's much, much easier to check against. Same way, if you wanted to use upper, you could also convert everything to uppercase. Just convert this to upper, but make sure that you convert this side of it to upper as well. 
a lot of people will get tripped up. They'll go to upper, but then whatever they type over here is not all uppercase. Therefore, it'll never match. Make sense? Okay. So that's upper and lower. We can also do a check to see if um, it is all lowercase or is all uppercase. All right. So what we can do is take their answer and we can say if choice dot is upper, that will check to make sure that everything they typed in was uppercase. All right. So we get back a true or false at that point. Or if you wanted to convert it all to is lower, you could do that and it would check to make sure it is all lower. All right. So upper converts it to uppercase, lower converts it to lowercase, is upper and is lower checks to see that whatever they typed in is that. So you would get back a true or false for those. Okay. You could actually chain these together. I don't know why you would, but you might. So you could convert everything up to uppercase and then you could also convert it to lowercase just by chaining them there. And if you really want to be silly, you can convert all to uppercase, all to lowercase, and then back up to uppercase. I don't know why you would, but you have the option of doing that. What would be nice is converting everything to lowercase and then maybe checking to see that it is all lower. You could do that. Yes. Uh huh. All right. Anybody got any questions on upper and lower? It's a great way to narrow down the amount of choices you get in from a person, all right? There's also some specialized is statements, which are going to make your life a whole lot easier, all right? So we have is alpha. That's going to make sure that whatever they typed in only consists of letters and is not blank. So if you expected letters, like you asked for a name and they typed in 42, this is going to return back false. And therefore, you could tell them, hey, that's not a name. Right. We have is alpha num. This is going to make sure that whatever they typed in was letters and numbers and had no blank spaces in it. So it's not empty. Is decimal is going to check to make sure it's numbers. Now we don't have to use try and accept when you ask for an age. Right. If I type in Jason for my age, well, this is going to check to make sure it's numeric numbers only. And therefore, it'll just say, nope, that's not valid. Or, you know what I mean? You have to program that to do that. So what would that look like if we came out here? We could say print, please enter your name. And then on our choice equals input, or we could just put name here. That would make more sense. Name equals input, something like that. We would put this inside of a while true statement, right? Because we're trying to sanitize this and make sure they actually give us a name. And then here we could say if name dot is alpha, right? If that's true, then print valid input break else. We could just use else because if it's anything else, it's not going to be true. We could say print that is not a valid name, right? So that one is testing is alpha. We could also test for age. So while true, print, what is your age? We can put in age equals input like that. And then if age dot is decimal, then print that is valid input. Of course, you don't have to print that is valid input. When you do this, you could just simply break out of it. Yeah. I, I don't think I spelled that correctly at all. It's a, a right? Way too much Oktoberfest print. My brain is fried. Okay, else print um, that is not a valid age please try again, right? You would say something like, please, please type that again. And so those are how you can sanitize name inputs, how you could sanitize age inputs, right? Somebody's got a question out here. Uh, user input, yep. All right, we also have is alpha num. This will make sure that whatever they typed in is again, letters or numbers, right? So you wanna make sure you're not getting blank spaces. You have is space, which is checking to see if whatever that is is only a space or a tab or a new line. 
A lot of times if you're doing a for loop through a big chunk of data, you may want to check to see if it has spaces. If it has spaces, you may say delete it or something like that. That's what you would use that one for. The last one is is title. And what is title is going to do is make sure that when you type something in, it starts with an uppercase character followed by lowercase characters. All right. Which means instead of using alpha na or alpha up here for checking names, you should always use is title instead. And what that is going to check for is making sure that I type in Jason with a capital J or whatever I'm doing. So if you're just wanting to check, you know, some string and it's not a name or a pronoun, then you can check for is alpha, right? If you're checking for a name, it should always be is title. And so in your midterm projects, if you guys are ever asking for a name, I expect you to use is title in order to check it. So if I give you back feedback, you're not sanitizing inputs. It's literally this. It's not complicated. You're going to put it in a while true. You're going to gather input from the user, check to make sure it is in title format. If it is, you could print it or you could just say whatever. You know what I mean? You could just break out of the loop. Else you're going to print that is not a valid name. EX Jason, something like that. Please try again. Wow. There you go. And it would keep them in this loop until they type it in the right format. Same way with age, this is going to constantly keep them. Now, this will just check to make sure they type in a number, but you probably should have the next checks in there to make sure that not only is it a number, that it's actually a valid number, right? So this one would be is decimal. And if it is a decimal, then we could go through our checks as to whether it's a valid age. So is age, um, and we can now convert this over without having to do a try, because we already know it's a decimal, right? We're below the if statement. So if int age is greater than zero and int age is less than 120, then we can say it's valid and break out of it. Does that make sense as to why we do that? Anybody have any questions? In other words, this a or the name, that's fine. We don't care. And it would even allow me to type in a full name, full name, first name, and last name, right? As long as I start with a capital and end with lowercase, it's fine. Does that make sense? So if I run this, just test it here real quick. Yeah, ignore that. So now it's asking for my name, right? If I type in gibberish, it says that's not a valid name. Try again. If I type in capital Jason and I type in Jason Zeller, it will take that because it took the capital letter followed by lowercase characters. Then the next part of that was an uppercase character followed by lowercase characters, All right? If it asks for an age and I type in letters, doesn't work. If I say I'm negative 100 or 1,000, it says it's not a valid age. So that checked to make sure it was decimal and then went one step further to make sure it was greater than zero and less than 120. And you can obviously set these bounds however you want, right? If you're asking for a score or an age or something that has bounds, you should be checking to make sure it's in those bounds. What's that? Yeah. So what else could you do to break up really? It's you set limits and if it's theoretically it less it's going to like or your name, but is there like anything else you could do that way to make it work right? At this point, no, because all you're checking for is age, right? And on this one here, if I went greater than 120 and said 400, I get nothing back, right? But notice I need to make sure that I get this copied in on this one here so that it actually tells them that it's not a valid age. Age rate, this is where you would say something like age range is zero to 120, something like that. Uh, let's see here. What if somebody types a decimal in the age? Um, we'll come to that. Uh, what situations would you use try and accept? So before you would use try and accept when you were trying to convert this over to an integer, right? But if you do the check before that for is decimal, you don't have to, all right? Um, other things on uh, on a try and accept would be, say you're trying to run a function on that, like do a math or a modulus or something like that. 
and there's a chance that you could break it, then you would use a try and accept. So this comes back to your midterm project is let your roommate test this thing, let your kids, your moms, your dads, whatever, somebody test your program and literally try to break it. Give them the most invalid input and not what you expect to go in there. And if they break it and you get a different error than what you would expect in here, then you would put that in a try and accept. In that case, if you get the error, you could say that's not valid for whatever reason. Yeah, so that's what somebody was asking on the age, right? So this asks what the name is, Jason, on the age, uh, 3.5, right? It won't take it because it's not a whole number. It's not a full decimal number. So if you ask for money, right, how much do you want to pay? $5. That won't work if we used his decimal. In that case, you're going to have to write a different kind of check. So how would you write that check? If you always needed to make sure that you had $5 or some, say you want money, right? Which means you need a dollar and period and two numbers after that. What if I gave you 15 numbers after the decimal? So what you would do there is you would use tricks like round. So there's the round function and that would round that to two decimal places or however many decimal places you want. Okay. That would give you say two decimal places. So then it would take whatever they said and always convert it to two decimal places. And then you're fine. You could also first make sure it's a float, right? So if we know it's coming in here instead of is decimal, you could try to convert it to a float. And if that doesn't work, then you'll do your exceptions and come back and test it that way. There's several different ways to go about that, but you got to write something to test to make sure that's valid. Just know when I'm working on your projects, if I type an invalid input and it literally crashes the program, goes to red text, that hurts. It's like 25 points right off the bat, right? Now you have a way of fixing that on the final exam, meaning that you just fix what you didn't do in the first. But if you turn in a bunch of stuff on your midterm and there's no sanitization going on, I'm going to break it right away. The whole point is that you now have the tools to test to make sure if you have valid input from the user. Now, what's another way that you can make sure that it doesn't crash? Instead of relying on input from the user, give them options, right? So instead of saying, what is your age or what is your group or whatever it is, you could still let them do those kind of questions. Or if you're giving them choices like left, right, something else, you could still make that as valid options and check to see if it's in the valid options. You could, um, uh, there's all sorts of ways to check. Just depends on the situation. A lot of times give them an ABCD entry, right? That's a whole lot easier to type on the keyboard than them typing in some long string of text. So if you say close the door, say you're writing a text adventure game, right? Instead of having them type close the door, you could have A, option B, close the door. B, option run away. C, option hide under bed. I don't know, I'm making this up, right? Then it's just ABCs. Then if you make all of your questions ABCs, all you have to do is have one list that has ABC in it. Always take their input, convert it to lowercase, and you can always check to make sure it's valid. Then you can do if statements. If it was A, do this. If it was B, do this. If it was C, do that. So you just do that and not have them work them in. Exactly. You very well could. It's however you design your program. Just know that if you do it that way, it saves you from having to write a bunch of different choices. But there may be things like enter your name. Well, that one you can't avoid, right? Or age that you can't avoid. The midterm projects, we'll talk about that more when we get there. Really, it boils down to making sure you get all the requirements um, and that it's something that you can build on for the final. But we'll definitely, we'll spend a whole day on midterm projects. And I'll give you guys some examples. And then you guys will have at least three more class periods to come here and visit and talk about your midterm project or email me or whatever.
All right, so that is the other is statements. Make sure you use them to take advantage of testing your code, making sure that it's valid input. Uh, what else do we have in here? You could also check with starts with and ends with. So this is gonna check a string and make sure it starts with whatever you wanna see that it starts with, or maybe you wanna check to see what it ends with. All right, so whatever you're having them type in, for example, you're typing in an address, right? What should that always start with? Numbers of some sort, right? Or whatever you want to test that you want it to start with. They're typing in a phone number. You may want to see that it starts with a parenthesis sign. That way you know that they typed it in the format that you asked them to type it in for whatever reason. All right. So starts with and ends with. Other things that are handy with strings is you can use join and you can use split. So join, you pass in a list of strings and it will join it together. By default, it does it by a comma. You can tell it what you actually wanted it to join on at another point, right? So what you do is like this one, you have a single quote, comma, space. Then you say dot join, you pass it a list of cats, rats, and bats. And at that point, it's going to join each one of those items in that list with a comma space. So if you had a bunch of things in a list and you wanted to print it out nicely, instead of doing a for loop and you wanted something to be comma separated, you may want to use something like this in order to combine that into one big string. All right. You could also use the space in order to join everything inside of here by spaces so that you get a nice output. And if for some reason you wanted to join everything by ABC, then it's going to join each one of these by ABC. So my ABC name, ABC is, ABC, et cetera. Usually you want to put some funky characters inside of here and you want it in a very specific format for whatever reason that may be. So you may ask for like 10 names from a user and then you want to have them all comma separated out. You could build a string based on that without having to do a for loop and some other stuff. Okay. Before, what were we doing to try to join everything together? Does anybody remember? Anybody remember the one where we tested building a string and then putting and at the end? So that the last one had and at it? It was. So what we did was we took the things in our list we did a for loop. We started off with an empty string, and then we used plus equals in order to do string concatenation to add it to that string. So instead of doing that, we could simply do this all in one whack. The only difference is, is here, we can't add and in there, right? But if we just simply wanted to make it comma separated, we could use the join command to do that. Likewise, you could use the split command. And the split command by default is going to split on white space. So if we have the string, my name is Simon, and we say dot split, it's going to split each one of those into an index and a list. This is handy if you want to split things that are comma separated. So say you're getting data from the internet or whatever you have is comma separated values, right? You could then tell it to split on commas and therefore it would split it into a list so that you could do all the things that you want to do within a list. You could sort it, you could do all sorts of stuff, right? You can also use split to split out multi-line statements. Remember that Dear Alice line that we had before? You could split on new space so that it automatically breaks it into a list for every time that you had a new line character. Then you could use a for loop to print each one of these chunks with maybe a time delay in it. And therefore it would print it out in chunks like you could read it. Remember when we did that? So it's nice as you can write, say you're doing a text adventure game, right? And you're printing lots of text to the screen. You could build out that string of text with the spaces and everything else doing the triple single quotes. Then you could use dot split to break that into a list so that you could print each chunk at a time. Anybody got any questions on join and split? All right, you also have partition. So partition is going to allow you to do things before it, whatever separator value that you pass it, and then anything after that. So say I have this one here called Hello World, right? 
and I want to partition on the W. That will build me a tuple with everything that was before the W, the actual W in the middle, and then anything that was after the W. So say you had this really long thing that had a comma in the middle and you wanted to separate those two values off, you could just tell it to partition on the comma. Then you could tell me, give me the zero index, give me the two index, and I always know that I'm getting the first part and the second part. May not make a whole lot of sense now, but when you start coding your projects, you may be like, I really want to split that. How do I do that? Use partition to do that. Okay. Uh, what else we got here? Okay, this one you guys will want to use. So we can also justify text on the screen. You guys have all used Word, right? Microsoft Word. You can left justify, right justify, center it. We will use those strings in order to justify things. So say we have the string hello, and we are just by 10. So that means that we're going to add white space to the left so that the total string contains 10 characters. So how many characters is five? Or how many characters is hello? Five. Five. See how I did that in my head? So it's going to add five white spaces in front. One, whoops, if I can click correctly here. One, two, three, four, five, right? If we do an R just by 20, it's going to add how many white spaces over here? 15. 15, right? If we have hello world and we want to adjust by 20, how many is that going to add over to the left? It will count the comma in the space. That's part of your string. Eight, right? So let's check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 11 total. Unless I can't count when I did through this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It didn't count the, the white space inside of here. That actually isn't accurate. I think he made a mistake there. That's not right. So L just is going to add right space to the white. R just is going to add space to the left. It's a little confusing, but you're trying to right justify it, therefore add space to the left and right. If you feed it a number that is less than the amount of characters you're trying to justify, then at that point, it will not do any justification, right? So if I tell you to R just this by three, it ain't going to do anything. Make sense? Anybody got any questions on that? So you could use something like this. Hello dot R just 20. And then said you didn't want to use spaces. You could tell it what you want to justify it by. Maybe you want to justify it by asterisks or dashes. Then all you have to do is add that in. And instead of white space, it will give you those characters. So sometimes this can be handy if you're building out a menu and you want a nice, cool looking menu in the front. You can do left justification, right justification. You could also do center. So if I have the phrase hello, and I want to center that in a space that is 20 characters wide, how many spaces are on the left and how many spaces are on the right? Well, the first thing to do is total characters is what? 20. Hello is how many? So that 20 from 5 is five from 20 15 right so that means we're not going to have the same amount of space on either side we can't right so it will give us one two three four five six seven on the left and one two three four five six seven eight on the right okay so if it is an uneven number it's going to give the least amount on the left and the most amount on the right. Should know that for a quiz slash midterm. Okay. Least amount on the left, the most amount on the right, if it is an uneven amount. But if I give you this string and I say, give me the center command that would just or show you this justification, you would then first count out how many spaces there are total, right? We need that in order to put it up here. 
And then you would figure out the character as it goes in here. And then you could tell me the character that goes here. All right. Again, if you don't pass this second option, it's just going to use white space. If you want to use something else, you can use that here. Everybody understand how that works? So you can see those kind of things and those methods are useful if you want to print a bunch of tabulated data out, right? So say we have this function here that takes in the items. It gives us a left justification, a right justification, and then prints those out. It's going to take in things like picnic sandwiches and then try to print those out in a nice clean format like this. That makes sense. So when you guys have your projects and maybe you're doing something that has like a menu for pricing and you want the text on the left to be left justified and you want the stuff on the right to be right justified and you want to add periods based on the total amount that you want to be total there. Does everybody see that? So this one here is going to add periods to get our left justification, whatever we set that to be. And we add just spaces on this side to get us our total. Well, what we would have to do is take whatever the max number is in this set of numbers, right? So if we look up here, it's going to go through the items and it's going to add that in there. So we would have to write something that would determine what the max length is so that that becomes our justification so that we justify all these other ones by that same amount. Everybody see what I'm talking about? In other words, we have 8,000 here, right? Which is how many characters? Four. So that when we go to justify everything else, we want to justify it by four. Therefore, in these, we're adding three white spaces, right? And these, we're going to add two. All right? If you want to strip off white space, say you've got a, a bunch of stuff that somebody typed in and you want to strip off the white space, you can use dot strip that will strip off any of the white space before your text and after the text. If you just want to strip off the stuff on the left, you would use L strip. If you want to strip off the white space on the right, you would use R strip. Everybody got that? If you had this, which was spam, spam, bacon, spam, egg, spam, spam, and we wanted to strip off AMPS, we would end up getting bacon spam eggs. See how that works? It comes here, it starts with AMPS, therefore we cut this off, and therefore we get spam. We kick off uh, AMPS, which is actually here, AMPS, AMPS, and then we strip that off, and the next one off. Okay? Anybody else have any other questions on what we've covered here? Manipulating strings, there's a lot to this section. All right. Okay. Now, say you guys are wanting to check the order of something, but you have a text character. Can we see if A is higher than one through nine? All right. Does anybody know hexadecimal? You have zero through nine, and then you go A through F, right? But if you want to see that A is greater than one, well, you can't really test that, right? So the only way to test that is to use what's called ORD and char. And what that does is convert it over to a Unicode number. So every character in the alphabet has a number in Unicode. So if we wanted to figure out what A was equal to, it's equal to 65. And you just use ORD, you pass in that character, and you get back a number. All right. Lowercase a is going to be a different Unicode than capital A. That way you can check to see if capital A is greater than lowercase a or something, right? So we can do ORD of capital A is 65, ORD of the number four is 52, and then you can see where they're at. Or if you want to do the char of those, you can say the char of 65 gives you back an A. If you want to see if A is greater than B, then you can do ORD of A, and ORD of B and make sure that A is less than or equal to, or whatever you want to say that it's equal to. Everybody make sense? This is particularly important if you guys are dealing with uh, wanting to do ordering or mathematical things on characters, letters, right? Or maybe you're reading in a string of bytes or something from the command line in a midterm project, you may want to be able to do ORD and char to make sure that things are coming in the way you would expect them to. 
So if you're get at gathering hexadecimal stuff, you may want to use that as ord and char in order to replace those out. Okay. Anybody have any questions on ord and char? Most useful for you guys if you want to see if A is greater than B. Right? You can't just say A equal or A equals B or A is greater than B. You can convert it over to a number so that you can do a mathematical operation on it, like greater than, less than, et cetera. All right. If you want to interact with the clipboard on the computer, right? So say you're trying to dump in information into your program and that's a lot for them to type, it would be easier for them to copy and paste it in. Or whatever the output of your program is, you want them to be able to copy and paste that out. So maybe you're having them give you a bunch of information. Maybe that builds a web URL, and that way you can copy and paste that web URL in instead of them having to type, type it all the way in. So what you would use is called the Piperclip module, and you just import that in at the top of your file. And then you can use piperclip.copy hello world. That puts hello world into the, the computer's clipboard so that I can then go out to notepad and copy and paste that out. So what does that look like? If I take this into our little program we had going here, like this, and I wanted to copy hello world into it. So before I run this, we let's open up notepad. And notice if I do control V, I just have that text in there right now, right? Nothing that we want. We say run, the program starts, ends, but when I come over here and I paste, I get hello world. Does everybody see what that did? It put it to our clipboard so that I can use it in a different program. I can now use it in Word. I can put it something else out there. If I have something that I wanna pull into my program, I can use paste and it will take whatever I typed into the program and store that here. So I would say something like uh, my input equals paperclip.paste and it's gonna store my input and therefore we will print my input. Now, if we run this, right now it's hello world. If I put something else in my clipboard, I say this is INF 360 programming uh, with Python. I copy this into my clipboard. I run this program. It's going to print whatever's in the clipboard. Okay. Is there something else we have to add? No, you just import at the top. Did you import at the top? Um, it should be installed. You should not have to pip install that by default. No, oh, I'm sorry. It does not. My goodness. This is a rough day today. Okay. So how do we install Piper Clip? You open up a command prompt and you're going to use pip install Piper Clip. Okay. And then hit enter that will install the Piper Clip package into Python. Now, in my case, it's gonna say it's already satisfied and that's why it worked. You do if you wanna use the Piper Clip module. Yep. So you open up a command prompt like this and you say pip, P-I-H-P, install Piper Clip. And not Cly, but Piper Clip, like that then you can import it into your project. If it says module not found, then you would need to uh, run that command. What was the command again? Pip install Piper Clip. And this will also be for any third-party packages that you use. So say you use Beautiful Soup or something else later in this class. If you don't have it installed, you have to use pip install in order to install that module. If you're out on the internet and you're working on a midterm project and you come across a module you want to use, you use pip install in order to install that module to your system. I don't know how to do that. I'm sorry? Maybe unintentional. Okay. So pip install will get that going in and that allows you to use the copy board, uh, the copy board, the clipboard on a computer. Doesn't matter if it's Mac, Windows, Linux, et cetera. 
it will either paste it out to the cup or to the clipboard or it will take whatever's currently on the clipboard but it's a great way to get information in and out of your project if it's a long output of whatever it is yes yeah you only have to do it the one time and it's installed on the system then from there on out if you want to use it in a project you can if you want your project to be able to like paste stuff on the session server, do they have to install? They do. So then at the top of your project, you need to say before running this, pip install blah. Yep. And we will show you how you can test and make sure that works. So right now we already know that if we import Piperclip and it doesn't exist, you get an error message, right? So let me just... Um, I think it's removed, but uh, yes. Okay, so now if I tried to run this project, I would get an error that's like this, right? So what we would do is we would, instead of just import Piperclip, we would say, try import Piperclip. And if that doesn't work and we get an exception, so we get an accept, we would print to the user, Piperclip, not installed. Please run pip install. Get this back over here. Pip install Piperclip. All right, and then we would wanna make sure we end the program right away because we don't want the program to continue. In order to use sys, we need to import sys up here at the top. So now we can use that try and accept, which was asked earlier, when would we use it? We want to use it anytime we're importing a third-party package so that we can confirm whether or not that package is installed. So we would try to import it. We can print to the user if it's not installed, and the system would automatically exit. If that package works, well, then the program just continues on. So now if I run this, the output is gonna say Piper Clip is not installed, please run this. Then I can copy and paste this directly into a terminal and go. That makes sense? It's a great question. So if I go back and install it, pip install Piper Clip. There we go. So now it's installed. We come back here and run the same program. Now it actually does what we expect it to. Okay. This was a, a check that you would need in your midterm project, right? If you're installing third-party modules, you have to wrap those in a try and accept to make sure the program actually brings them in correctly. Yes, if it is a third-party package. In other words, you don't need to try and accept uh, random or sys, right? Those are built into Python. If they don't import, you got really big problems bigger than just running Python, right? But if you're using a third-party module like Piperclip, always wrap that in a try and accept so that we can check to make sure it's installed on the system. Don't need to worry about it. Yep. And you only want to import what you're actually going to use in your project. Don't just randomly import everything. That makes your program very, very large. Okay. Uh, let's see here. They've got some projects on how to do some command line arguments. So if you guys want to use those in your projects, you could definitely do that. So say that you wanted to type in some command and then pass in a command line argument to it, it would do that. Not quite what you and I were talking about, but this would be if you wanted to run it from the command line. All right. Um, let's see here. Another project is doing wiki markup, which if you guys know wiki, you have to write it up in a different fashion, right? Um, another project. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so to do a little bit of recap, this one here is a good practice project for you guys to try to figure out. This used to be a homework assignment once upon a time. So what you need to do is write a function named print table that takes a list of strings, right? A list of a list of strings. So that's two lists, right? 
So in this case, we have one list here that has apples, oranges, cherries, bananas. Then it has this string, then this one, and that is inside this overall list. It's called table data, right? We want to make sure that we print the first one down. Notice how we're printing these going down, and they are all right justified. Right. So how would you first start going about printing this data in this fashion? There is a hint right here that tells you that. Right. So in order to get this right justified, we have to first figure out how long the longest one in this list is. So we have to take this list, figure out what the longest one is so that we know how to justify it going down. Kind of what I was talking about earlier, right? Then you have to join this long string together where you have this one that's justified, then the next column's justified, and the next column's justified. Make that one string, print that string. Then you go down to the next line and build that up. So it's a, it's a pretty tricky little function. And it will, this kind of starts you off and walks you through it. Do that one, do the zombie dice bot. I encourage you guys to kind of play with those two projects so you guys know how to really start building your own projects at this point. Okay. Anybody have any questions over this material? I know it's a lot. There is always going to be automate the boring stuff.com for you to go out and reference back. Okay. So when you're doing your midterm projects, use this page as a reference on how do I go do that. Your midterm exam is open book, open note, open PowerPoint with all the answers on the PowerPoint, right? So use it as a reference. I don't need you guys to memorize this stuff. That's the reason if you've noticed on the quizzes, I'm not asking you to memorize it and do it right off because the truth is, is nobody ever memorizes this stuff. Some of it will become second nature for you. But if you don't know, how do you figure it out? You go look it up, right? And so knowing how to go look it up or some reference, that is what matters to me. In the real world, when I hired pro Python programmers, if they didn't know, I would say, well, how do you find the answer? Then they go out and give me the documentation of all that. If you guys were in um, in the advanced Python class, we don't even have a book in that class. We just use the documentation of whatever we're talking about. Why? Because they need to know how to read the documentation. If they're not used to reading documentation, then when they go look stuff up and it looks like Greek to them, then it doesn't do them any good. So I'm not looking for you to memorize answers on the midterm exam. I am asking for you to go look them up. Now, if you use them in your code, then you should be able to explain it, right? So if you don't know this and you go ask ChatGPT to build it out for you, Okay, but if you don't know what ChatGPT did, then it's not going to do you any good. So I don't even care if you use something like ChatGPT to help you help your code. Say you have an error and you cannot figure it out. Go ask ChatGPT how that worked. What, what am I missing? It will tell you, but then you should know what you did wrong so that the next time you didn't do it wrong, right? Don't expect to use ChatGPT to write your midterm project. It will not work for this class. I'm telling you right now, it won't work. Why? Because I don't tell you what to build in your midterm project, so you have nothing to feed ChatGPT. Anybody got any questions on manipulating strings? Practice them, play with them. That's the only way to really learn it. That's, that's all I can tell you is just go through those practice examples down at the bottom, see if you can figure those out. All right, um, that will be it for today's class. On Thursday, we will get you jump started on homework assignment three. I strongly encourage you to be here for that one. If you're here, I'm probably going to take you through almost 50% of the, the homework. You'll just be required for the last 50%, which is actually the harder part. So, <laughs> All right, we'll see you on Thursday. Online, you guys got any questions? All right, we'll see you Thursday then.